thank you very, very much for turning up this morning. It's a Saturday morning, so I understand if you want to go for your long runs or your long cycle rides, but anyway, we're all here. And it's our first mid-year forum in, uh, since COVID hit. So it's, I'm a bit frightened seeing all these people here. Anyway, so uh, the title is Unmasking Opportunities. And uh, thank you, TD Ameritrade, for sponsoring it. So unfortunately, it's against the background of rising interest rates, inflation, war. So all the, all the bad news, although the Dow went up, but Vishnu is going to take us through all that bad news. Okay. So interest rates, and this, I mentioned this in our last meeting, interest rates affect every aspect of our lives, and mainly unconsciously, down to our cover this week, down to the chicken, down to the chicken rice stall. Right? Yeah, all right. Thank you. Um, so this morning, uh, Vishnu, who is uh, Head of Economics and Strategy at Mizuho Bank, um, in his presentation, A Matter of Interest, will unpack some of the risks that um, the current board of the Federal Reserve has in store for us, a lot of risk, and most of it is bad news. Okay? But I think he, 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 may, he may come up with a silver lining or two. Okay? Um, our second uh, speaker is Leonard Eng, Trade Desk Manager, TD Ameritrade Singapore. And his presentation is titled, What Does, post -pandemic, what does the Post-Pandemic U.S. Economy Look Like? So um, over there, we could find out if there are investment opportunities in the U.S. market, hopefully, so there are always. Um, and our last speaker is Paul Ho, a Senior Director, Asia Pac Equities, UB Asset Management. His uh, presentation is on the future of Asian tech stocks. So Paul will compress everything there is to know about the different types of Asian tech stocks in half an hour so that we can make better investment decisions. Yeah, all right. So um, we will end the morning with a panel discussion. If you have any questions, please send them via the pigeonhole. Right. And um, Vishnu, take it away. Good morning, everyone. Um, so it does say unmasking, and that's probably what I should start doing first. I have to say, uh, Gula set the bar really high. I don't think I'm going to tell you everything there is to know about this. Um, uh, and, and I want to also add on one other, one very other uh, important point uh, that you need to take note of, which is uh, anything and everything useful you need to know. Anything and everything useful you need to know, Leonard and Paul will let you know. I'm just going to talk us through the interest rates. So essentially, if you look at this chart here, the opening chart, we're just showing you the federal funds rates since 2012, alongside two-year interest rates and 10-year interest rates. So it's two-year yields, 10-year yields. You can see how sharply two-year yields have risen already. Uh, and, and the 10-year yields also have gone out hard. Typically, when markets anticipate that the Fed is going to hike interest rates, some of the movements come in anticipation. You don't actually wait for the rate hike. Um, but here's the point. The point is, the Fed has gotten increasingly hawkish. Uh, they look like they're going to hike at a pretty aggressive rate. So we may not have seen the end of upside in uh, interest rates. So, okay. So, Essentially, this is a, a very, very quick talk. We've got 20 minutes to cover a lot of ground. And so for that reason, I thought I'd confine what we wanted to discuss. Five things I want to bring us through. The first thing I want to bring us through is the motivation behind why interest rates are going higher. A lot of that has got to do with inflation, uh, but we'll find out some of the more technical details around that or the more interesting nuances and points. The second thing about this is, let's get to the gist of it, which is how high will interest rates go and how fast can interest rates rise? What that needs to feed into is the overall tightening that the Fed is doing, which includes draining US dollars from the markets. Quantitative tightening, or as they, deem, uh, as they call it, balance sheet runoff. So this is going to do two things at the same time. Bring up interest rates as a separate move, and then draining dollars. So you've got less supply of dollars and higher rates. That's going to compound the effect. So that's worth looking at. The fourth point we want to make is that this movie, in different versions that we have watched before, usually doesn't end well. Typically, when the Fed goes on an aggressive rate hike, it tends to lead to a recession. So we want to openly question that, which is, why would they risk a recession? What's their thinking behind it? Um, 
And then lastly, we're going to say, look, uh, let's look at what the, what the risks are that we are facing from a more academic standpoint. So the chart you see on your left here is basically inflation in many parts of the world uh, by regions. And this blue line here is the US. So you can see that from a very, very stable inflation pattern of around 2%, in fact, for a while below, it's escalated dramatically. So it hit 8.5, it came off down to 8.3, but that's, that's really no consolation. So you've got US inflation running super hot. And there's a, something exceptional about this, which is in many, many decades, we've not seen this. We've not seen a situation where US inflation is higher than Asia's inflation. This is almost like we swapped inflation souls. So it is, it is a very queer thing. Uh, there are many other points about that, but I digress. I did say I'll keep this tight. So what does that really mean? So here's the thing. It's not just that inflation has escalated rapidly. It is more profound. It's also more pervasive. It's across the board. So it's not just confined to certain cost shocks. It seems to be uh, spilling over. So you get it going into rentals and things like that, which is what's worrying the Fed. And they also see signs of it going into wages. They've got a tight labor market. And so they are afraid of a wage price spiral. So it's more pervasive. And for that reason, they think it could also turn out to be more persistent. So the three Ps of inflation that worries them, profound, pervasive, and persistent. And that's really what's getting them going this time. And of course, it doesn't help that previously they've been caught on the wrong foot, saying that it's transitory. To be fair, we also said it's going to be transitory. <laughs> um, and, and, and for us, we didn't, of course, see things like the Ukraine war coming and many other factors. But you know, this is my job scope. I come back every six months to tell my clients why I was wrong six months ago. So what does that mean for the Fed? If you look at this nerdy chart here, this is a simulation of the so-called Taylor Rule. When the Fed wants to ease policy or tighten policy, they look at two conditions. They look at two conditions. One is inflation, the other is the job market. And so here you can tell that when COVID hit, the unemployment shock, so the job market shock was a huge negative shock. And then there was also a negative inflationary shock, which is why you see their policy rates were cut dramatically the policy rates can be read on the right axis. Now you've got a huge inflation upside shock, which is consistent with the policy rates being around 25 to 3%. And coincidentally, that's what the Fed is telling us it could get up to. For your information, just a, a, a technical point on this chart. Yeah. This chart under accounts for a hot labor market because the labor market is not just hot because unemployment is low. The labor market is also hot because they've got very high quit rates and they've got huge job openings that are not filled. And for this reason, wages are rising very fast in the US. I'm sure some of us here feel some envy about rising wages. Nevertheless, I digress. Let's, let's get on. Now that we've covered what's motivating the Fed's rate hikes, let's get on with where it's headed. In June, the FOMC, there will be a Federal Reserve meeting. So every quarter, March, June, September, December, what the Fed does is they release their own consensus within their board of where they think interest rates should be. Markets dub this as the so-called dot plot because they put dots of where they think inflation will be, and that's a dot plot. And this is how much more aggressive the Fed has come. So I want to demonstrate to you how much more aggressive the Fed is. Middle of last year, the Fed thought there would be no rate hikes this year. That was middle of last year. You see this yellow bar here? Each of these dotted lines refers to one rate hike. So at, as a December FOMC, the Fed thought this year there will be three rate hikes. And for, to be sure, when I say a rate hike, we are referring to a typical standardized 25 basis point rate hike. So 50 basis point is considered a double hike, right? So this was back in December. By March, the Fed expected seven rate hikes. So that's dramatically, it's more than double. They're more than twice as hawkish. But that's not the end of the story. Since March, this is where the Fed is. So this is basically the May, March meeting, they hiked by 25 basis points. May, they hiked by 50. So there's a cumulative 75 basis points. By January next year, they expect interest rates from zero will be between 2.75 to 3%. So this is what markets are expecting of the Fed based on how hawkish the Fed is sounding. And that sounds about right because the Fed is pretty much committed to raising rates by another 50 basis points in June 
and then again another 50 in July before they, want to, they may want to temper their pace. So we've got another 100 basis points of hikes coming sooner rather than later. That's, that's how much more hawkish they've turned in, in terms of their inflection. Last year, we made this call that you know, we deem and, and we have dubbed the Fed uh, Kokomo Fed. This is the first time I'm doing, I'm saying Kokomo in a live audience, so I, I, I just want to, I, would, I wish you would uh, indulge me and, and raise your hands. Who knows the Kokomo song from Beach Boys? This is almost heartbreaking. So um, all my colleagues pointed out I must be pretty old because they don't know this song. Uh, so basically, that, that line there, you want to get there fast, but there's a caveat so you can take it slow, so that you don't have to over-tighten later if you move early and fast. This is their thinking behind wanting to do 50 basis point move now. But here's the caveat. The caveat is, I think markets, I mean, we, we are, the way we are all wired as human beings is we, we are able to see things that are easy to quantify. Interest rates are pretty easy to quantify. You hike by 25 basis points, you go another 50, you know exactly where that, that is. But I just want to show you how much more hawkish the Fed is. And when you say something is more than something else, you need a basis for comparison. So I'm comparing this to the last Fed tightening cycle. Bear with me here. This is a wonderful chart because this axis here can either be read as basis points for interest rates or billions of dollars per month in reduction or infusion of dollar liquidity. So the red line you see here is the rate hikes. So the last time this happened, the tightening cycle for the Fed usually starts with taper. They start, uh, they start paring down how much bonds they are buying and then they start the tightening cycle. So the last time this happened, the 2014 tightening cycle, it took the Fed almost two years from taper before they started with the first rate hike, just 25 basis points. And then they waited another full year for markets to adjust to get to another 25, and they went on a cycle. This time, they started taper in November. By March, you had your first rate hike, and then you're getting a whole volley of hikes. And that's to say, if you want to get to about where we peaked out the last time, 225 basis points, they took 60 months to do it the last time. They took five years. This time, we don't even need a year to get there. So in our local lingo, aga aga, five times as hawkish when it comes to rate hikes. But there's this other point that I'm a little bit more worried about. That is what that is QT, quantitative tightening, or the drainage of dollar from the markets. Because the last time they started this, they waited almost four years before they started draining dollars from the market. So they gave it a lot of pause for markets to get adjusted. And when they started, they started at just 10 billion a month. They started drink and they slowly stepped it up. They hit a peak rate of 50 billion per month drainage, but that didn't last very long because we went into the trade war and then they started easing again. This time around, instead of waiting that four years they waited, we haven't even waited a year. You started rate hikes in March, and by June, they are going to start draining US dollars from the markets. How much are they going to drain? 47 and a half billion per month for the first three months. And after that, the plan is to step it up or double it to 95 billion a month. Let me frame this the other way. Some people will argue that the last time they did the tightening cycle, the Fed's balance sheet size was four and a half trillion. Now it's nine trillion. So some people will refer to the 50 billion peak rate the last time around and the 95 this time and say, yeah, should be about double. But let me frame it differently for you. In the first year, they were draining dollar liquidity in the last cycle. Their average monthly rate was 19.2 billion. Now they're hitting 95 billion. So again, aga aga, five times as hawkish. So five is a nice number to remember in terms of how much more hawkish they are. So you're going to get a mix, very quickly, a mix of both rising rates and diminishing dollar supply. And that usually isn't good news. So what I'm going to just quickly show you here is the Fed's balance sheet size. This was pre-GFC, 2008. About 800 billion, that's how big the Fed's balance sheet was. And you know all this money printing we're talking about? That started the, the expansion of the balance sheet and the Fed got up to four and a half trillion before they did their last cycle of quantitative tightening. And then COVID hit and the balance sheet size just went berserk, nine trillion. This, is, this will explain to you why markets are so overvalued, why everything's so rich and everything's so expensive. 
from your Rolexes to your houses to everything, you name it. But here's the point as well. This red line here shows us the Fed and the ECB put together the change in their balance sheet size, and I've correlated it to the MSCI Global Index. That's the, that's the rub. When you drain dollar liquidity, the only thing that's related more or correlated more tightly to market valuations or, or, or market uh, assets than interest rates is probably liquidity itself. I'm fast running out of time, so I'll just show you this chart first. This is the Fed's rates starting from 1990. I wanted to start in 1978, but that would have been too coincidental to the year I was being born, so I just shortened this chart a little bit. These gray bars here are all recessions. This was the Asian financial crisis, which is not a US recession, so I put it on a shorter bar. You can see every time there's a rate hike, I actually put how much, how, many, how much cumulative rate hikes there were. That has typically led to a recession. This time, this is where we are up to now. This is where we are projected to go, poss possibly higher. So that brings with it the risks of a recession. Now, why would the Fed risk this? There are two reasons. One is there's some confidence they can manage a soft landing, so to speak, soft landing. So they're hoping that they can hike it fast enough and then later temper it, maybe even reduce if they need to. So there is this whole thing about Kokomo. Get there fast, take it slow, hopefully nothing bad happens, fingers crossed. The other is the path of least harm. Because they think that you know, if you get infl let inflation get out of hands, and then you want to deal with it, the outcomes are far worse. So they are caught between a rock and a hard place, and that's not good news for us because it's a very, very narrow path to a soft landing, and at least in between, there will be quite a bit of turbulence and volatility amidst this uncertainty. And that's really what's worrying us. I'll show you one more chart here. You saw these recessions here and the rate hikes. There is another way you look at uh, recession risk, that, and that's what you call a yield curve inversion. If your short-term rates are higher than your long-term rates, that's an inverted yield curve because a normal yield curve is upward sloping. These are all the times when the yield curve inverted because this takes the difference between uh, long and short yields, and if they go negative, there's an inversion. So you can see that in the previous cycles, whenever it inverted, there would be a recession. This time, we got quite close to an inversion with your 10-year, 2-year. If you look at your 10-year, 2-year, it's heading that way. But here's another thing. The Fed is desensitized to this. The Fed is saying they don't look at 10-year, 2-year inversion. They don't care if 2-year rates are higher than 10-year rates because the Fed has got a different measure, which is your uh, shorter term rates, your three month, 18 month difference, and that's exactly opposite, it went up. So that's to say the Fed is not going to respond on time to an inversion this time around. So this, of course, accentuates the risk. I'll come to my last point, which is what are some of the difficulties and the trouble that comes with um, higher interest rates? You basically got a flow impact. So basically what happens is, higher interest rates, debt servicing gets higher, uh, that means that the cash flows get tighter, whether it's for households or for corporates. So that's your flow effect. There's also a funding squeeze because the Fed is actually reducing physical dollar supply. And then there'll be an asymmetric distribution. Some banks will hold more than others. So whether it's in the interbank market or for companies trying to get funding, sometimes getting dollar funding can become difficult, there will be a funding squeeze. And you typically also get a stronger dollar that erodes purchasing power in so far that your imported goods are in US dollars. So this impact is the flows impact. Your day-to-day -day cash flows become tighter, whether it's corporates or household. There's also a stock impact. The rate hike determines your risk-free rate. The higher your risk-free rate, the higher your discount rate, your valuations come down. That is the stock impact. For quantitative tightening, because it's, uh, it's, it's reducing uh, the purchases, or rather it's getting rid of uh, selling off bonds at the longer end, it increases term premium. And it also increases uh, credit premium because they're also selling off uh, mortgage-backed securities, so on and so forth. I'll just quickly touch on the term premium. In so far that long-end US Treasury yields give you a better return, I'm not going to argue that they're actually risk-free, but in so far that they're perceived as being risk-free, markets can then just go long in US Treasuries and not be in risky assets in emerging markets or in the higher yield space. So that means when you get this combination happening, the risk of capital outflows from emerging markets, including Asia, is higher. And that's what usually starts off the macro stability risks. What are the mitigations? Anyone with positive cash flow, 
better um, and more manageable debt cover, whether it's in terms of the absolute debt or how it's structured so that they can cover the payments. If you've got dollar revenue steam streams, of course, that helps. And if you've got inflation hedge or pricing power, again, that also helps. So these are the mitigations, but it's not going to uh, uh, offer complete buffer. I'm coming to the end already. I just have to touch on two points here. First point is, this uh, blue line you see here is U.S. inflation expectations, and the green line you see here is 10-year U.S. Treasury yields. Usually there's a good correlation, which is boring. I'm not interested in that. I'm interested when there isn't a good correlation. And this time around, I'm interested when 10-year yields go higher than inflation expectations. You see this portion here? 10-year yields went much higher than inflation expectations. That corresponds to about October 2017. And coincidentally, October 2017, if you look here, is when quantitative tightening started for the record. So this is something that we need to be wary of. Quantitative tightening is going to start June, step up in September. Then there's every possibility that your 10-year yields can shoot up much more than inflation expectations. So there is a possibility that your long-term yields can get up to 3.2 to 3.6%. That would not be an outlandish, outlandish suggestion. This chart here just shows you Fed rate hikes versus the dollar, how strong the dollar is. Two points to note, usually the dollar gets stronger well before the peak rates. So one can argue the dollar should be at about its strongest now. But here's the caveat. If you look at the last time around, uh, so you can, you can argue that you know, the, the dollar this time has already pr priced in all the rate hikes, so it should be okay. Dollar shouldn't get any stronger, right? That's in an ideal world. If you track the cumulative tightening, so earlier you saw this chart, now I've put together the rate hikes and the uh, quantitative tightening. If you look at the last cycle, when the Fed started quantitative tightening, the dollar got stronger again. So that's to say, going into Q3, Q4, there is every possibility, not only will foreign exchange markets be volatile, the dollar can have bouts of very, very strong episodes, which again isn't very good when you've got capital outflow risks and when you're dealing with the current situation, which is very close to being stagflationary. So with that, I, I apologize for the rushed lecture, but, uh, rushed seminar, but i um, happy to take any questions later. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christian. Um, right, so our next speaker is Mr. Leonard A. Uh, he's going to talk about something that's very quite closely related to what Krishna is talking about. So let's see. Leonard, please. Thanks, Kawi. So my name is Leonard. Thank you all for coming uh, for on a Saturday morning. So I'll just rush in into the uh, presentation direct. So what does the US economy look like post-pandemic? So what I'm trying to do is to paint a story, a potential story uh, that is not uh, an, an advisory. So basically, it's just exploring possibilities like what uh, Vishnu is doing. So for myself, I lead a team of specialists. So outside, you will see two of them. So after this, there will be a break. There, we do have some umbrellas to give away. So it's just uh, no strings attached. You can come along, uh, talk to them, have some friendly chat with them. That's fine. So my trade. So basically, we offer trading in US stocks. Uh, at any, most of the exchange listed products we have also will be available through us. So what I'm going to do, we'll be talking, uh, exp explaining a story first. So this story is about Levi Strauss. So everybody knows about the Californian gold rush, but then nobody knows about what is, what's, what's his genes got to do with the gold rush. So people usually rushed to California in the 1800s to mine gold. But then they only wear pants that are very thin, that, that torn easily. So what happens, Levi came along thinking, hey, can I sell them jeans or pens that actually can last throughout the gold rush? So that is what the gist of today's discussion is, is to find enablers in this post-pandemic world and not to rush in with the hype later on. So as you can see, selling jeans. <laughs> so three points, what happened? And then after that, we want to look for the end of a hype. What is a hype? I'll explain later on. What are the pointers? What are the symbols? What are they doing? And lastly, we want to look for enablers that are working behind the scenes, like what Levi's is doing. So you can see what does the pandemic do? It exposes weaknesses in businesses. So it affects everybody internationally, across all sectors. 
it exposes weaknesses. And then it comes into the point where priorities are reshuffled, which means, am I going to diversify? Am I going to look for resilience? Is my business going to be better after the, after the pandemic? So this forced a lot of people to go into digitalization. So you have heard this keyword time and again, whether over here in the news outlets over here, but then globally speaking, you cannot deny working from home. You cannot deny Zoom calls. And then this also help businesses which are semi-digital. So semi-digital, which means some companies has already uh, used something like DocuSign. Have you heard of DocuSign where uh, contracts are signed digitally using the software and then you can print your name there, timestamp it. You don't even need a physical uh, signature on it. So that is semi-digital. So where uh, the accelerated of the digitalization comes in is where they are using Instead of DocuSign itself or image, uh, imaging technology, you can actually manage your documents and then have artificial intelligence to resort the data into a table format automatically. So without any human intervention, and that is being forced during the pandemic, where businesses are actually contemplating and digging into their reserves to, to look at that. So secondly, I'm talking about the laggards. The laggards are the ones that I I watched on Facebook yesterday. So I, I saw select catering that gives Tinkat to people. So Tinkat are, are meals ready to eat, uh, serve every day, different menus. So they are a very well-known catering company. And then what is the younger generation doing is engaging the digitalization process to include WhatsApp, to include online forms. And that is augmenting something that is an analog business. The car workshop that you are going to doesn't have a website. So now they are starting to think of, hey, should I get a website? Should I get WhatsApp going? Should I augment my business with some digital um, avenues? So on the right side itself is something I've gotten from McKinsey Analysis. So this is a reference point. A reference point from when? It's 2007, the, great, uh, the financial crisis, where the last, you can see at, towards the end, um, the green, sorry, the blue areas that are already going upwards or trending upwards will be three different sectors that I'll touch on. So this is firstly, we have media, we have telecom, and then we have technology. So all these are what I use for referencing what is going to happen next in the post-pandemic world. So this is from 2007, the total returns for the growth rate for technologies in these three companies that managed to eke out some growth after the 07 financial crisis. In conclusion, it is strategic dexterity. So this dexterity means uh, for smaller companies, they are small in scale, they can move around, they, can, they are nimble enough to really change the business operations quick enough and nimble to, to adapt to economic uh, situations. Uh, and then, but sometimes these are maybe family companies held back by conservative culture. So the larger ones are maybe larger in scale, slower to move, but then with digitalization forced upon them uh, by the pandemic, no choice. Everybody has to go ahead and just do some retooling or calibration during this time. So this is the heart that I'm talking about. So I put up some symbols over there for you to take note and as well as booking.com. So this is gotten from the Think Assume trading platform and then I've located and drawn the line that's pre-pandemic. So in the US itself, it's unlike Singapore. Mass off are, are pretty much early on than just Singapore itself. You can see on March itself, the CDC can say it, you, people can gather around, vaccinated people can gather around indoors without masks. So that is in March 21. So you can see that after that, there's a boom. There's a boom of the uh, stock prices. And then there are many bookings. There'll be domestic travels going on. And then after that, the CDC further opened the, uh, the whole economy up by saying that you can travel domestically. So in some way, the hype is gone. So under the model of uh, diffusion innovation theory, I mean, you, you can look up diffu um, the diffusion of innovation theory. So that three quarters of the adoptees or adopters are already, have already moved in and the prices has, have already assimilated into the, uh, the stock market. 
So what is the remaining will be the laggards that are, have yet to come in and then that's where you can see the sideways movement in prices. So this will, what we are experiencing now, people queuing up in the ICA getting their passport done or re-extended. So that is the travel sector. So what I mean is that this hype in the US is already in the passing or on the way towards the graveyard. So any peripheral industry that comes along with the travel industry like um, hotels, like healthcare itself, even the tests that you need to do now for traveling in and out are also on the decline. So it is quite similar what we can learn from the US that is going to um, be more relevant locally. And lastly, events like this, conventions like this are already started a year ago. And then for now, we are just starting. So the hype itself, it could be a leading indicator for what comes next, where the enablers would rise behind the scenes. Okay, so media itself, I've also, media is uh, something that has been consumed tremendously during the pandemic, be it working from home, be it even studying from home, home-based learning, some media is undeniable. So even myself, I'm guilty of overdo, overdoing my, my shopping online or overdoing my Netflix. And that's where each, each one of us are also um, is inescapable truth from that. So social media itself is going to stay. In fact, for millennials like myself, we are maturing. And then the social media itself is going to be a new norm of media for us. And then what's next will be something called the app-based or OTT type of content that is being pushed out. So you have noticed keywords like Disney+, Plus, HBO Max. So even MediaCorp itself has a MeWatch. So MeWatch itself, they are pushing content through the app itself. So for, to look out for media companies that actually evolve into the next frontier is where are they pushing out an app of their own? Are they pushing content through the app itself and driving additional distribution channels through the app. So through the app itself, even for a smart TV, you can install it onto your Samsung TV, LG TV, and then and bypass YouTube, bypass the, the traditional mainstream avenues, and then uh, consume the content from there. So from this, and I have three counters over there, which you will see later on. So these are Comcast, AT&T and Verizon. So AT&T and Verizon, traditionally, they are like Singtel and Starhub. So they are stepping into spaces that are including content creation. So there are lines blurred. And just do take note that many of these brands itself have sub-brands. And if you want to see growth in the sub-brands itself, look for the signs that are they running, uh, are they evolving into the next frontier of uh, distribution. Next, I have um, technological resilience. So it's a very, very big word. So what I can say is, as I mentioned earlier, there are companies that are semi-digital or analog, and are they on the digital dexterity, um, the survey itself? So Gartner made a survey and then asking questions like in the matrix, where are you on the, the matrix itself? So are you really prepared? Are you having the final, which is having either a digital arm of a business or a digital business itself? So there is questions to be asked so that you know where your current holdings or the stock that you're holding, where are them in, the, in that matrix? And then the benefit of having a digital arm will be something by McKinsey again. So there is a three times projection of revenue growth across all these traditional sectors. Traditional sectors like automotive, like aerospace, as well as the semicon industry. So these are very traditional. They are like the super tanker that's very difficult to change directions, whether it be bureaucratic or be it skill. So if they are able to augment their current skill uh, sales avenue with uh, digitalization, they are able to boost uh, three times output in terms of revenue growth. In short, digital transformation, it is crucial. It is here to stay. And then I will touch on three counters and something that is close to your heart in terms of hearing the chicken rice <laughs> later on. So we have three symbols all listed on the US stock exchange. And then they are in charge. They are the enablers. 
that help companies retool, recalibrate for the new future after pandemic. So first, we have Accenture and IBM. So these two are the giants. Nothing new is needed to talk about them. They are giants and they are able to serve clients, use the experience learned from serving clients to open new digital businesses avenues to guide them and do the migration from there. The client base are including Lenovo, L'Oreal, Lufthansa. So you can see it is big thing. So something that needs some emphasis is Cognizant. So Cognizant, this small paragraph says that NTUC Fair Price, which includes some of our chicken purchase, has engaged Cognizant in their digital transformation. So a lot of people are not realizing, hey, why is there a Fair Price app? So how is it relevant to us that Cognizant it is in our life? So all this digital transformation that's happening in the background are being shown here. So on the right side itself, I've drawn up, uh, I've collected from the World Economic Forum's uh, survey that in 2022 this year, comparing four years ago, plenty of repetitive work are being replaced with a lot of automation. So be it just pure repetition, they are including the, the, the jargons like artificial intelligence, machine learning. So those companies that actually use and implement all this that affects us day to day, including like optimizing your Google Maps to come to this location, is being done by all these fellas. And lastly, the telecom sector. So remember, three sectors I've mentioned earlier that really did well during the 07 crisis is media, and then um, the technology, and lastly, telecom sector. So telecom sector, I've managed to dig up, to dig up some um, research, which is um, work from home effects or the work from home kind of survey. How often are we going to continue it after COVID-19? And then plus the, the Zoom, the Zoom calls. The Zoom calls are not going away. Either uh, the monkeypox is going to stay around or is going to be continuing to engage in workplace flexibility for people like us. So in terms of that, to provide that home, instead of uh, focusing on business connectivity for the, the three telcos, AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile, so they are shifting their focus towards enhancing home connectivity. So in the US itself, it's not like Singapore where we have like gigabyte kind of um, connection. We for them, it is 100 Mbps is already the, the par standard for, for, for US customers. So in such way, load balancing is occurring for the telcos. And then once they use this pandemic to do some recalibration in terms of the business, telecom itself, you can see it being stable. You don't want your, your, your FaceTime with your grandchildren having some jerky videos. So these are the backbones that is powering the whole, um, the, the whole pipeline. And lastly, uh, I have, we have this on the Think of Swim platform. So for all the components that I mentioned, how do I see, how do I get a, a bird's eye view uh, using the Think of Swim platform? It is called the heat map. So the heat map itself, I've just specifically drawn up the S&P 500, and then we can expand into sectors and subsectors and then how big the square is, the size itself will show you the cap market capitalization of the stock. So how big it is itself in relative to the next stock in the same sector. And if you want, you can expand into the subsector and then see what goes on and break down further. So the color gradient is actually the market, the price changes. So with a bird's eye view, this would summarize um, on, how to see, on how the economy is doing at the night, in the night when, when the stock is trading or the, the, the exchange is, is moving. Uh, two more slides. So if you want to learn more, we do have the uh, TD Ameritrade uh, Learning Center. So if you don't have an account, um, it, we have the, uh, the, the, the folks out there to guide you, uh, to teach you what to do, and then uh, the, the address to open the account with. And then on top of that, you do not have an, you do not need an account to visit our learning centers or so. So if you are just starting out, you can just visit there, click through. We have tons of articles to learn more about not just the markets, to use the platform and everything out there. And that's it. Thank you, everybody. I'll, I'll just stop here.
Canada is a very favorable to be our sponsor for this morning as well. So let's take a minute to thank them. Okay, good morning everyone. Once again, I'd like to uh, thank all of you for spending this uh, very precious uh, Saturday morning with us, um, listening to our presentation. Hopefully, you know, we can offer you a, a little bit of insight that can uh, uh, help you make better investment decisions. So, the topic for me today is actually the future of Asian tech stocks. Now, um, when I think about tech stocks, um, you know, I don't, don't well, it's, it's good to take a step back and uh, think about the bigger picture of what's happening uh, in tech around the world. Uh, Leonard has given you know, quite a good presentation just now, uh, highlighting some of the uh, enablers of tech that are doing well. Now, how about some of these uh, other trends? Okay, I, I've kind of simplified it, you know, um, what I call the drivers of tech demand in the future. Um, computing is definitely one of them. Now, how many of you believe that um, in the three, five or ten years' time, you're going to be using more data rather than less data? <laughs> okay, Vishnu, thank you. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, that's right. So, um, if you believe that we're going to use a lot more data, um, certainly we're going to use uh, a lot more uh, computing power to process the data into something more useful, right? So, that, that, that is one a uh, very good driver of, uh, uh, you know, tech demand in the future. Um, and of course, uh, Leonard uh, spoke about, just now, about the uh, overdose on Netflix. I think uh, everybody uh, knows that. So, if you're a user of Netflix, uh, you're a user of Gmail, I guess many of you are, um, then you definitely are using cloud services, right? So, cloud uh, and computing goes hand in hand. With all this data, it doesn't sit on your mobile phone, doesn't sit on your PC, um, it actually sits on some servers in the, in the what do you call the data centers, right? Huge, big buildings, all, all computers. So these are very um, computing intensive uh, uh, kind of applications. Now the other, the other um, big driver for tech demand, I would say, would be uh, communications generally. Um, again, I ask myself this question. Now, how many of you here believe that uh, in three to five years' time, even ten years' time, you will be more mobile with your data? I mean, you will consume more of the data on your phone than on your desktop PC. I mean, if you even own a desktop PC. All right, so if you believe that uh, you know, you're going to be more mobile, uh, you're going to be walking around and consuming your data, then there you go. You know, that's the driver for uh, more communication services. And again, um, you know, uh, when we talk about communications, I recently we talked about uh, 5G, right? So you want, everyone wants faster data, not slower data, right? So, and, and you're watching Netflix in, uh, maybe in some, uh, sometime later in, in the full HD, HDR, right? And that is a lot more data that needs to be streamed. So you want it more, you want it faster. So you need uh, more uh, communicative uh, or communications technology. And the third one, Again, I think it's quite easy to understand. Um, do you believe that uh, in three to five years' time, uh, you're going to see more electric vehicles on the road than uh, what you see today? I don't know how many vehicles you see. Is it uh, one in a hundred? Maybe not even that. In a hundred cars I see on the road, hardly, I, I, I hardly see a Tesla here. So you can imagine, you know, in the future, of course, everybody is uh, going very green now. Um, we're going to want more uh, EVs, what they call electric vehicles. And, and that uh, in itself is a driver of a lot of things. Now, some people say that uh, electric vehicles um, are all of the future. Uh, it's actually, um, you can think of it as a computer on wheels, actually. Right? Uh, you have a big screen, uh, you're going to have a lot more uh, well, entertainment options. It's definitely more wired up than, than what cars use. I mean, cars used to be just point A to point B, but now you, you do a lot of uh, 
uh, things in a car. In fact, uh, in the future, you'll be, uh, people are talking about uh, self-driving cars, so you don't even need to drive anymore, right? Uh, you key in your destination, uh, your vehicle will bring you there. So I think um, some of you uh, who are very familiar with China, I think you've probably seen some of the big tech companies, uh, Tencent, Alibaba, they already launched uh, robo-taxis. Can you believe it? Robo-taxis. Um, so literally, I mean, if you dare to, you know, you sit in there, uh, they will bring you through, uh, breezing through the wonderful traffic of uh, Beijing, you know, and Shanghai. So this is, I, I think this is one big uh, driver for, for tech um, in the next couple of years. Um, uh, and, and consumer. Um, consumer. Again, um, I don't know how many of you have not done online shopping before. Anyone? Okay. Hardly, right? So, so there you go. So, consumer, I think we're going to do a lot more um, of the online shopping um, than, than what we used to do uh, before. Uh, and again, that will be a driver for consumer platforms, which I'll talk a bit more about uh, you know, in a couple of minutes. And manufacturing is something that we don't see, right? But it happens in the background. Um, but uh, trust me. Uh, a lot of factories are going uh, more automated, right? They have robotic arms. Uh, in fact, uh, they have uh, AI. I mean, um, Leonard mentioned uh, Cognizant, right? Uh, NTUC. Um, you know, they, okay, they're not in the manufacturing business, but they are consuming a lot more data, right? Um, so what, what is the theme uh, uniting all of this? Uh, actually, we're going to uh, need a lot more computing power, right? Um, and it boils down to... Um, I think two very promising areas for, for Asia tech. Um, the first, I would just put generally uh, as a demand for Asia semiconductor. Um, and secondly, um, I will talk about platform companies in Asia. I, I find these two, uh, uh, I think, pretty promising areas if you want to look at Asian tech stocks. Now, this is just a tidbit, okay? Just, did you know that, uh, you know, for the past 10 years at least, China actually imported more semiconductor chips than oil. So that's how important um, semiconductor, semiconductor is. Uh, again, not, not just for, for China, but indeed for the rest of the world. Right? Uh, uh, and, but uh, you know, China, because it's in, in the Asia, um, it's very important. In fact, uh, it shows you that um, you know, there's a huge growth potential. Um, but not, not just as a consumer, I think China uh, eventually will also be a very big uh, uh, manufacturing uh, base for semiconductors. Uh, I'll touch on that again uh, in a couple uh, of minutes. Now, this is uh, kind of like a semiconductor investing 101, right? If you really simplify, I mean, semiconductor can be quite uh, um, daunting to, to analyze, right? And a lot of uh, jargons, a lot of technology, but uh, uh, today, since you're here, let me give you a, a simple way to understand this, right? So semiconductor industry, broadly, there are three categories. One uh, is the design, right? Um, these are people who designed uh, the chips. So after they design the chips, somebody has to manufacture them. And normally, these are very different companies because manufacturing of semiconductor chip is a very specialized business. Um, and in fact, I can tell you how, how specialized it is. Um, so then, there is uh, the third category, which is the testing. So after you, you make the chip, somebody has to test it. Again, it's a very specialized industry, and, and, and uh, there are companies that just do one of each category. Now, today, I'm not going to talk about the third category. I think um, there are huge opportunities um, in uh, what they call the, the fabless, which is the design of uh, uh, chips and manufacturing in Asia. So, this chart shows you how Asia actually dominates semiconductor manufacturing. I think uh, many of you would have heard of uh, this company called uh, TSMC, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company. It's uh, caused a lot of uh, uh, controversy uh, recently, I think uh, especially the last couple of years. Um, all of a sudden, the US and the rest of the world realizes that, oh no, uh, there's this company in, in a small, Thailand called, you know, small island called Taiwan, um, that actually manufactures most of our semiconductors. Um, and uh, again, I think most of you use smartphones, right? So you have uh, your Apple iPhone. Um, you have, uh, if you are not using Apple, maybe you're using Samsung. Um, or maybe you're using Xiaomi. But uh, you know what's common about all this? Most of the chips 
especially the more advanced uh, phones, they're all made by TSMC. There's no second company that can make it. Um, so it's a, it's a very strange uh, situation right now. Um, and we only arrived at that situation um, you know, in the last maybe five, 10 years where literally nobody knows how to manufacture this uh, small uh, uh, semiconductor chips that runs your computers and your iPhones. Um, how small is it? You know, I, I don't, you, you always hear people talk about five nanometer, uh, you know, 10 nanometer. It's, it's literally, you can, you can put tens, if not uh, hundreds of these chips on the, on the breath of a hair. So you take a hair, um, you can uh, have a whole line of chips down there. That's how small these chips are, right? So, and um, not surprisingly, Taiwan produces 52% uh, of the world's uh, uh, chips, and, and that's mostly high end. Um, China, 17%. South Korea, 12%. So even Singapore produces more chips than the United States, right? So um, Asia is uh, definitely dominant. So um, South Korea, you might have heard of a company called Samsung. Um, yeah, so they, they, they are dominant uh, in, in making a lot of uh, chips as well. So they don't just mix, they don't, don't just make your TV and your phones, they make uh, semiconductor chips that run it. Now this is something else that the most people would not know. When I talk about uh, uh, chip designers, so somebody has to design the chips, and, and it's a very specialized business. Um, what, what sort of things need chips? I, I told you, you know, your, your phones need chips. So there's this company called MediaTek. You might or might not have heard of it. Qualcomm, you certainly have. Qualcomm runs most of your iPhones. But the biggest, they, they share the market almost equally with uh, MediaTek. MediaTek is a Taiwanese company. Um, you know, it, it, it does uh, a semiconductor, uh, uh, mobile phone chips as well, uh, very high end. Um, and uh, they, they are amongst the world's uh, largest company. So somebody uh, uh, basically just uh, um, came out with these statistics, right? Out of the top 10, uh, what they call IC design companies, so basically they are semiconductor chip designers. Uh, four of them are in Asia. Um, but let me tell you something interesting. Uh, we see NVIDIA and uh, AMD. Uh, some of you might have heard of NVIDIA and AMD. So NVIDIA produces graphics chips. Um, the last time, you know, if you're a gamer, computer PC gamer, uh, you know, they, they used to produce that. But now their biggest business is actually to run the AI chips. Chips that uh, uh, run the uh, loads of loads, uh, analyzes loads and loads of data uh, at very fast speeds. So they are a very, very big company right now, right? So they are, even after they've fallen by half, uh, I think they are close to 400 billion US dollar market cap. So, uh, so why do I mention NVIDIA and AMD? Um, you might or might not be surprised to know that they're run by Taiwanese. So the, the Asian connection is very strong there. And how about Broadcom? Anybody heard of Broadcom? They used to be called Avago. Um, and uh, Avago is a Singapore company. You might not have heard of him, but... Uh, uh, so Avago is uh, the CEO and founder is a guy called Hock Tan. So he founded this company. It's grown very, very big, and in fact, it's so big that it, it ate up a, another big US company called Broadcom. So now it is very, very dominant. As you can see, it's the world's third largest um, chip designing company. So anything, from, anything that you, you need for communications, even for industrial purposes, right? even your Wi-Fi, uh, your antenna. You know, you, by the way, you have uh, uh, hundreds of parts. You don't just have the processing chip, you, you have you know, like the antenna, the RF frequency regulator. There, there are a lot of things. If you are an engineer, um, it, it, there are a lot of chips and uh, circuits inside your phone. Uh, they're very high end, and only this company can, can design it. So there you go. So it's definitely more than the four big companies uh, based in Asia. So um, definitely, I would say uh, a lot of them are based in uh, Taiwan. Uh, and, uh, you know, these, these are companies that don't manufacture, right? They just um, uh, design the chips. And uh, these are very high margin business, right? You just get together a few PhDs, uh, you know, they design the chips, and then they outsource the manufacturing to TSMC. I can imagine how, I mean, how much, uh, how much margin, you can imagine how much margin they, they actually make. So these companies have very high ROEs, they generate lots of cash flows over time, they pay a lot of dividend. Um, and, uh, you know, over the last uh, 10 years, something fantastic has happened for some of these companies. You know, I remember when I uh, started covering this industry, maybe, uh, whatever, 20 years ago, um, there were many, many of these IC companies, all very small. Everybody just focused on small parts. And eventually, 
Uh, I don't know what happened. The, the Taiwanese keep growing and growing, and the Americans keep shrinking. And then finally, you're only left with one or two dominant companies uh, in each of these fields. Let's say, for instance, um, you know, um, uh, some of you have, uh, um, uh, you know, your audio um, devices, right? Some of the audio devices. Um, if you know, you would have heard of a company called uh, Realtek that actually specialized in some of these. Uh, well, again, nowadays you only hear Realtek because they, oh, they, the rest has disappeared. And, and what happens is that once you have a few big companies dominant there, you, are, you start printing money, right? Uh, nobody, no challenges, you want or not, you don't want, done, right? <laughs> you can go, there's nobody else you can buy it from, then you have some lousy sound. So, so a lot of these companies are making uh, uh, tons of money right now. Um, let me switch gear a little bit. Uh, I spoke just now about consumer companies. Um, how many of you uh, don't know any of these companies at all? Uh, Taobao, uh, JD, uh, Grab. Uh, never heard of them before. <laughs> um, well, I thought so, right? So um, that, that's that's um, that's the future of uh, how uh, consumer companies will, will evolve in the future. Uh, and, and, and why do I like, uh, uh, or why do we like uh, platform companies? Uh, first of all, what's a platform company, right? Uh, platform company is, is, is uh, it's kind of like a place where people kind of gather. And um, it, there's this concept called the network effect that I can, I'd like to share with you. Now, what makes these platform companies uh, very valuable? And why, are, why are people paying tens, if not hundreds of billions in value for companies that are hardly even profitable? Right? Um, because they realize something, um, that they have, these companies have very strong network effect. Um, let me illustrate this uh, network effect. Um, how many of you uh, use uh, WhatsApp? Okay, or Line, okay. Okay, how many of you use Viber? Like, what? <laughs> yeah, I mean, so maybe some of you use Viber, I don't know. <laughs> so this, you, you get a point. So if you are the only guy using Viber, I, I bet you're not communicating a lot with your friends, lah. Uh, right? So I, I don't think many of your friends are on Viber. So that's the whole point, right? Uh, but hey, you know, if you're on WhatsApp, you know, your friends are on WhatsApp. Everybody, you want to get the services, you want to contact somebody, uh, your, your plumber or whatever, you WhatsApp them. Nobody uses Viber anymore. So, and and the, the the more people there are in the network. Um, the more valuable uh, this network is. There's actually a mathematical equation, believe it or not. I mean, the mathematicians have an equation for everything. Um, so they tell you exactly how much this is worth. So, um, and, and they say that the number of people that you have on the network, uh, uh, the more you add to them, the more exponentially the value of the network grows. Okay, that's as much as I'm going to tell you about the mathematics behind it. Um, uh, while in layman's term, um, it's basically that uh, once you have a head start um, and uh, everybody's on the platform, uh, you gain advantage, right? You gain advantage and uh, it's very hard for somebody else to come, um, you know, just like, just like grab, you know, it's very hard for, once you come in, it's very hard for somebody else to, to do another grab. Uh, and, and eventually you would think that when they have the marketing power, they start squeezing all of you again. Right, <laughs> so that's a very sad thing. If you notice nowadays, if uh, you notice that grab, uh, you know, um, grab rides are getting more and more expensive, or you find that the Shopee is giving out less and less promotion, um, you know what's going on. <laughs> and uh, at some point, hey, you got no choice, right? I mean, <laughs> you, that, that you either use them or you, you uh, I don't know. Can you even flag a cab now these days? <laughs> Hardly, right? So, so this this is the economics of platform economies and. Every country has their own uh, big thing that is uh, irreplaceable, right? The Taobao, um, I can't imagine somebody coming out with another Taobao. I mean, how many hundreds of billions you're gonna, you're gonna spend on that? Um, same thing, These are, some of them you may not be familiar, right? Uh, Momo is a big, uh, is a big one in, in Taiwan, Gojek, Indonesia. So these people are investing for the future. So uh, once, remember, once you're there, you're probably going to be there for a long time. Lah. So uh, eventually, some of these will become uh, uh, you know, good investment targets. Now, but uh, you know, you're, I don't think you're here to, to listen to, <laughs> to these trends and tech. You want to know, uh, actually, you know, whether it's time to buy, right? <laughs> That's why you're here, <laughs> whether it's time to buy tech in general. Um, so timing is everything. Unfortunately, um, you know, uh, 
uh, I think in, in Leonard's words, I think uh, you know, the hype is uh, still dying. Uh. So, <laughs> so we saw some hype on the way up. Uh, I think it's still, you can, you can tell, uh, you don't need to be a technical analyst to tell that uh, the chart is somehow sloping down. The trend, we're in a downtrend. Um, so, so in investing, um, you know, it's important to, to pick the right companies, but it's also important to, to pick the right time to get in there. Um, and, uh, you know, they always say cheap gets cheaper. You know, I've been hearing recently a lot, oh, Alibaba is uh, whatever, the cheapest that it's been, I don't know, 10 times PE or whatever. Um, maybe I can share with you a little nugget of my investment experience. I've had uh, invested in companies before that went from uh, 10 times PE uh, to 8 times PE to 6 times PE to 4 times PE. I mean, there's no end to this, right? That's, that's, the, that's the problem with uh, value investing. So at some point, you say, okay, I, I, cannot, be, I cannot be in there early. Right, uh, too early. Right, so um, at some point you you have to look at the technicals to, to guide you. Uh, maybe TD Ameritrade has uh, wonderful tools to help you there. So yep, there you go. Now, what's the big picture? So a lot of you must be in a lot of pain recently, la. I mean, if you have invested in tech of any kind, right, uh, you must be sitting in some kind of uh, losses that. Yeah. But hopefully you're not losing sleep over it. Uh, but uh, you know, if you look at the big picture, uh, f uh, first of all, you're not the only ones. Um, but uh, it, you know, it's also happened before, right? Just take, take some comfort. This is the share price chart, historical share price chart of Amazon. If you are invested in Amazon, uh, you know, during the well, pre-dot-com uh, bubble, guess what? You know, within, um, like, like you look at 1999, within a year, you would have uh, experienced a crash of close to 60% twice. And then after that, you had a decline of 95%. Um, you can't really see the bottom there, but I think it's about $5.50, right? Uh, and just as it recovered, uh, you know, in 2003, it declined another 60%, um, and then it declined another 60%, and so on and so forth. So, so the, the, the road of investing uh, with uh, Amazon has been long and painful, right? Um, so uh, imagine, okay, you don't have to pick at the bottom, okay? Let's say imagine somehow you're late, you know, you, you bought it at 10 bucks and said, ah, I'm just going to sleep a bit uh, because it's, it's, uh, I got high, high conviction on Amazon. Uh, anybody know what the share price was at the high recently? I think like uh, the high was 3,700. Let's say three, okay, uh, you, let's say you're no expert, you sell it at 3,500 or even 3,000. So $10 to 3,000, if my math is any good, that's about 300 times, right? Uh, uh, US. US, Amazon, uh, yeah, AMZ and US. Uh, so, so there you go. I mean, so um, for all you um, long-term investors out there, uh, enjoy the ride. Uh, don't, be, don't lose too much sleep. Um, some of you might know this old guy here, uh, Charlie Munger. Um, he, he's the long-term investment partner of, uh, of Warren Buffett, right? Um, and uh, here are words of wisdom, words of comfort here. I've had my Berkshire stock decline by 50% three times. It doesn't bother me that much. That's just a natural consequence of an adult life. Right? So, hey, that's, that's, uh, Charlie, even Charlie Munger, you invest, he lost you know, half his money uh, at least three times in his life. So, what can I say? I think uh, probably it's time to put on our adult pants and uh, get on with the business of investing. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to have you remain on stage and all the other speakers uh, joined by Kula to be the moderator for panel discussions. So, um, so I'll take the questions in terms of the votes, you know, who gets the votes, the, the ones with the most votes come first. But I'm very, very curious about the recession. So this is not in the questions, but I'm going to ask it anyway. What's, what's the probability of a recession? when I'm asking <laughs> the gentleman <laughs> on my left. <laughs> um, so I, I guess I, I, I must try to put a number to this, particularly since I said it's a very narrow path to achieve a soft landing. Uh, I also want to attach some caveats around it. So the first thing is, on the current course of the Fed, that's to say if they get between 3 to 3.5% three by the middle of next year, there is a 1 in 3 chance we hit a recession. And that's, that's me watering it down a bit because the definition of a recession can range, right, depending on what you define a recession to be. So you get one in three chance. Uh, the biggest caveat here is whether or not the Fed changes its path along the way. 
because we can't take today's expectations to be a given and static. Uh, and over the last 10, 15 years, one of the biggest change in the Fed is that they no longer just look at inflation by itself. They also look at how markets are doing. So if markets start tumbling really fast and they get cold feet and they pull back, a very perverse outcome would be you get uh, financial turbulence, but you avert a recession. So there could be many permutations to this, but as we stand, the simple numeric answer, which is a very bad answer, is one in three chance. Okay, so that's rather unfortunate. All right, then I'm going to start with a question with the second most votes, and that is the, um, which is a bigger worry, a US recession or a China self-induced slowdown? What's the bigger danger for Singapore? And uh, there was a follow-up question further down, which is not there. Um, and, th and that is, um, do we decouple? Do we ever decouple from any from China, from the US? Can China decouple from the US? Uh, sorry, you all get your day in the sun. <laughs> so I, I think um, <clears throat> the China risk is, is real. I mean, I, I don't think that China is going to be able to engage in enough stimulus to work its way out within this year. Even if they numerically hit a certain growth target, they cannot inspire underlying growth uh, to become self-sustaining just because there's so much pain in tech and property that you haven't reinstilled confidence yet and infrastructure alone will not cut it, not this time. Uh, which is the bigger risk for, uh, for us in Singapore? M my best guess is US Federal Reserve tightening because the interest rates pervade many things, whereas a lot that's going on in China today is somewhat more self-contained in so far that China, their first order priority is to re-establish their supply side. That's to say they want to get their industries back up and running, they want to get manufacturing up and running, which, which would, with some lag, alleviate some of the supply crunch we see. So in, in a way, China is going to work, in a, work its way such that the downside pressures to growth from China is going to get alleviated, but it will probably be more than offset by the US. And the question of decoupling, I don't think Singapore has got the option to decouple either from China or from the US. Um, that's a, a romantic and nice notion to have that we can insulate ourselves. But we are really like a little speedboat in a very choppy sea. That is very, it's very difficult to avoid the tides and the waves. So just learn to swim, everybody. All right. So I'm, I'm going to uh, go according to the, you know, the, the popular questions. So this one, well, I also want to know this. I think all of us, do you think the stock market will go up or down? <laughs> I'm going to start with Paul. Um, do you think the stock market, would, do you think the US stock market will still go up, particularly now after the correction and despite the upcoming hikes in the next few months? I'll start, I'll start from that side. Yeah. So Paul um, Leonard. This is a very uh, philosophical existential question because the stock market always goes up <laughs> after it comes down. So <laughs> the stock market can only go up, down or sideways. So yeah. So if you go down, it has to come up sometime. I think the question I think uh, would be when it's going to go up. I think that's what everybody is interested to find out, but that's not part of the question. <laughs> Follow up on, well, it's, it's like his one third chance, there's a one third chance of going up, down or sideways. No, when would it go up? Um, you, you want a date? <laughs> yeah, as close to a date. I mean, we, you don't have to have the exact hour or the exact moment of the low or the high. <laughs> yeah, no, actually, actually, I mean, the jokes aside, I think it's, everybody knows it's, it's uh, Nine well impossible to, to figure out when the bottom is. Um, I think the best answer we can tell you is uh, it's probably not now, right? Um, it, it, this is probably not. But yeah, you, you feel like I said, you know, you might be feeling a lot of pain. Um, but uh, if Vishnu is right and the interest rate is going to continue to go up, and the U.S. going to go into uh, one third chance of going into a recession, um, yeah, I think you should expect a bit more pain before before the relief. Um, yeah, that's a short answer to that. Um, but uh, the date, I'm not so sure. Maybe, maybe sometime this year, later this year, there might be a chance. Maybe Leonard has an idea of what day will bottom and start going on. I would say to tap on to Vishnu is depending on the signs. Because we cannot, it's like landing, it's like the moon landing. There is no definite date that we can pinpoint to, but we can look at signs or leading indicators to point a direction or probability towards 
So if the current situation continues with the inflation going on, rampant inflation, we are wanting to look for sectors or, or certain stocks or signs that are pointing towards that direction that we want to engage in. Okay, thanks. Okay, I, I'm not going to um, ask um, um, Vishnu. This is a question. D d can you have a look at it and answer it? Um, so I'm, I'm going to uh, get to the, uh, the the usual retort, which is, uh, you know, the, the broken clocks are right twice a day, right? We will be in a bull market at some point. Trust me. Um, <laughs> My, my, my fear is right now it may be more of a bull trap. Uh, bear markets are very famous for episodes of correction followed by rallies. Uh, so the, the point here is it's not going to be a one-way ride. The markets are not going to make it easy for us, not in the next few months. Uh, and don't take my word for it. I'm, I'm really not a market person, but I'm just putting it out there with the, from a very fundamental point of view that if the Fed is going to drain dollar liquidity, and they're going to step it up by September. At least in Q3, I expect more volatility to persist, uh, which means things get a bit murkier uh, and, and harder to predict. Uh, that's as much as I, I know, and I totally agree with Leonard that the, 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 the fundamental structure of it is uh, markets do go up over a period of time. You just have to adjust for when inflation is going to rob you of some of those gains and when the volatility is going to get in the way of that. Yeah. Okay. So, so I'll, I'll move on from there. There's a there's a question here on, on someone who's interested. Well, that was anonymous who asked that question. We are in a new bull market. It's almost a statement. Okay. So, um, so there's a question here on the Japanese yen. Uh, could you take that? It's dropped a lot compared to the U.S. dollar and the Singapore dollar. I think that's also a question of the interest rate differential, isn't it? <clears throat> right. So he's going to answer that question. But with the widening interest rate spread and policy, will the, can, will the yen continue to drop? He's also from the Mizuho Bank. So what's the Bank of Japan going to do? Are they going to, I mean, forever they've been at the, they've been on the acceleration. Um, so this is, this is a, a question that we encounter very often, of course, anything to do with the yen. Uh, there's a lot of interest in that. Uh, so the way I look at it is, uh, with the yen where it is the, the most important decision you have to make, is whether Japan will allow tourists in, in a big scale way. So your year-end holidays, you know where to go. <laughs> We've established that. Uh, from a policy point of view, the BOJ seems to be very intent. So the BOJ is in a different, very different path to the Fed and the ECB. They are an entire spectrum. The Fed is almost unapologetically hawkish. The ECB is apologetic about it, and they're trying to make excuses, so they'll be a lot slower. Uh, and, and so the euro is not going to surge either until we get past maybe Q3. BOJ is adamantly dovish. They're saying that, look, whatever inflation they're saying, they're saying, look, this is a cost shock and it should pass. And they remain very committed to policy. But that's a broad brush statement, so I'm going to say this first. A, uh, further weakness in the dollar yen, because you can see from the yield spreads that a lot of it has been baked in. So unless you see 10-year USD yield stay surging another leg up to say 3.2 to 3.6%, you could possibly see another round of steep yen sell-off, especially if it's accompanied by high oil prices, because that's the other thing that sent the yen down, which is that their trade account became very negative suddenly because of their, their reliance on energy imports. So that's one caveat. The second point around that is, BOJ can remain dovish but still tweak some of their policy tools and without going into details, if they tweak their reference to yield curve control in a way that they allow uh, the spread between USDs and JGBs to be alleviated somewhat, that could also very quickly arrest uh, unmitigated downside in the yen. Uh, for, for now, our view is that there could be a lot more downside in the yen, particularly in a very volatile fashion coming into Q3. But beyond that, we think it's more a stabilization function, but even as, and, and especially if the Fed starts pulling back. Because there's so much expectations of the Fed is so high that even if they slow down their rate hikes, that could still give some stability to the yen against the dollar. So those, those are very unhelpful generic views about the yen. Because you're going to have more generic views <clears throat> now. So uh, there's this question, and I think we looked at it earlier, the week's Fed's meet, minutes 
have shown dovish sentiments. Well, it was not quite dovish, but you've got to explain that. And so what are the odds of an interest rate rise in the second half of the year? Um, or is that not or, or, or not? Yeah, but I think I'll put all my money on the interest rate hike. So wh whoever posted this question, it tells me you've been watching the Fed quite carefully. <laughs> so you're absolutely right. Um, earlier this week, we had the minutes of the last meeting, so the minutes from the May meeting. It wasn't outright dovish, but what it revealed was that as hawkish as they are and as much as they expect rates to rise very rapidly, they have no one step to say they are quite committed to 50 basis point hikes in June and July. And beyond that, if the data allows them, there is a room, there is room for them to temporary. They didn't say it in those exact words, but that's what you can read between the lines. So my point here is nothing is guaranteed. Uh, if anything, for now, they may err on the side of containing inflation and re-establishing credibility. So they may start slowing down their pace of rate hikes. It is very unlikely they're completely going to stop hiking rates in July, unless you get a huge market sell-off that causes them cold feet, in which case our biggest worry won't be the Fed, it's about catching falling knives, or as someone else put it, uh, falling chainsaws, which are much more dangerous. So those would be what we would look at. I'll give him a rest and I'll go to Paul next. Yeah. So how will the Fed rate hike affect CAPEX and you know, CAPEX uh, for, the, for the tech sector, would you say? Um, actually, I don't think we, we need to be that concerned about the, the capex per se. You know, I, I mentioned just now that some of these um, um, companies that we can look at, you know, the, the, the chip design companies, not so, not so concerned about capex. They, don't, they, they just design. So um, I think, uh, but the point, I think that the link between interest rates and, and tech companies is this, right? Um, and also in growth stocks in general, is that the higher interest rates uh, normally means uh, lower valuations for growth companies. I think that, that much is certain. So again, if Vishnu is right and rates are going higher uh, from here, um, then you should expect a lot of pressure. Uh, again, the, 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 the mathematics behind it is because uh, interest rates are used as a discount rate. Right, so if you, you, your discount rate goes up, the value goes down. And it's very sensitive, right? It just has to go up a little bit and the value drops a lot. Okay, again, that's as much mathematics as I'm gonna put into this. Yeah. Do you have anything to add on that, on that, Leonard? I on think I agree with uh, Vishnu also. We have to look for the, to rein in inflation first, mm -hmm. before anything can be established further, before a look into the fundamentals on where to time your uh, investment decisions. So it is all dependent on where the rates are going in, in the second half of this year. Uh, also, just, just let me, can I add my one cent, one cent worth? Um, interest rates do affect indirectly discount rates and everything is valued based on discount. And most things are valued based on the discounted cash flow. So um, as interest rates rise, the valuations are likely to fall. It's a matter of the formula. So valuations are likely to fall. So that's my, my one cent worth. Um, so the next question is, so will higher interest rates affect equity? So that is my one cent to work. But Paul, do you want to, to add to that? Because there's a question, will, uh, will it affect the valuation of equities? And yes, because everybody yes. takes, all of us take our valuations of, of interest rates. That's but right. You, so maybe you, you, you're more qualified. Maybe just, <laughs> just, just, uh, just a little point. Like I said, I think uh, um, there are equities and then there are um, higher growth equities because Gro well, growth companies means most of your, you're expecting most of your cash flows to come in the future, right? The large cash flows are going to come in the future, and, and those are the ones that get discounted very, very heavily. Um, so, so, yes, so unfortunately, growth companies are the ones that will be hit more than the, the other normal companies. That they're just at that point. Second part is, are there any sectors that will benefit from higher interest rates? How about your, the company you work for? Ah, banks, yes. Okay, I think, uh, I, well, let me qualify, I'm not a full-time bank analyst, but, <laughs> you know, this industry is very specialised. But uh, what I can say is, uh, in general, yes, uh, banks do do better in a higher rate environment, but it also depends on the, the you know, the shape of the yield curve, right? Because um, uh, banks tend to borrow uh, far in the future, and then they lend out uh, normally, you know, shorter term. So if you have a situation of inverted yield curve, it's actually bad 
for it's actually bad for 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 banks uh, margins uh, in, this, this is a general principle um, but uh, yes and then it, therefore it should be no surprise if you guys are, are watching the markets that uh, actually the financials have done much better than you know as a sector it's done much better than the most of the other uh, sectors so yes it's good for for banks in general and also, uh, I think we should watch also for the bank's um, liquidity coverage ratios, especially for US dollars, because that's where the, um, in the banks, with the most US dollars are likely to weather this better, because I think we discussed earlier um, that when US, when with QT, there'll be less US dollars. So what will that do to our interest rates, our local interest rates, the QT part? Uh, for Singapore, we are global <coughs> price takers of interest rates. So typically, when I mean the, the easy way to think about it is, if U.S. rates are rising, uh, then you know our borrowing costs are going to go up by quite a bit. In this case, uh, we may witness or, or experience even sharper rises as QT sets in for two reasons. One is <coughs> quantitative tightening simultaneously raises the term premium and credit premium, so you have a higher add-on to the baseline interest rate. Uh, the other reason, of course, is the actual dollar funding because it squeezes the dollar funding. Um, you know, banks that are squeezed on, on the funding side of things will probably need to charge uh, whatever cost they receive. So these are some of the, um, uh, the, the general points. But of course, it really varies in Sing, for Sing lending, it really varies on the Sing dollar funding position of each of the local banks. And the good news is, the local banks are, are well funded in Sing dollars, so I'm not trying to tell you that. Uh, I'm not trying to talk down my bank by saying that we can't lend. <laughs> but this is a it's, a it's a known it's a known factor, which is uh, the good news is that uh, you know the, the good funding the good Sing dollar funding means some of the, the the worst impacts are blunted, but none of us can escape rising rates. That that's just a rule. Um, yes. Sing dollars, and we are, all our banks are also funded less with wholesale funding, but more with cheap, their cheap deposits. Well, that's very important because if you look at Australian banks, they're funded. I mean, they're largely wholesale funding, and the other banks, all, all the banks, I mean, the banks in India, they all have problems with the funding part. But our banks are very, very well funded with our cheap deposits. So we should all band together and get more higher rates. Okay. Um, next question is about oil. I don't know whether. Um, I know that um, TD Ameritrade tracks some of this uh, because you track futures and so on. So with oil staying at $100, um, how will this affect the um, economy and, and equities, do you think? I think for oil itself, it affects everyone. The, if you pump petrol, you will see the gas prices jump, not just Singapore, even some of us crossing the border to Malaysia. So. It affects everything, including the inflationary cost that we see in day-to-day -day grocery shopping. Because everything needs transportation, transportation relies on oil. Most of our transportation are not electric vehicles. So, so it gets passed on to consumers like you and me. And then eventually it will find its way in terms of the oil price hike it will find its way into our pockets, like it or not. So unless there is something, um, a measure that is put out, if not, we will all have to sustain this uh, oil-affected inflationary cost that, that's been passed on to us. So uh, unless maybe OPEC opens the tap further, supply drops or, or something, if not, we have to brace for impact, at least be uh, mindful of it. Maybe I can just add a, a little bit to that uh, as well. So, um, you know, oil price rises, it depends on whether um, your country is exporting oil, right? I mean, if your country is exporting oil, yeah, woo I mean, you make a lot of money, right? Or you're, if you are an oil company, yeah. And so so um, it's good for some people, it's bad for others. So I think in general, um, maybe I, I generalize this also to commodity prices, right? since a lot of people are very concerned about other commodities other than, than oil, right? So um, I think in the world, there, there are two kinds of countries. Uh, one is the import, um, commodity importing type companies, uh, countries, um, and then there are the commodity exporting countries. So you can, you can see, I think um, in the last 10 years, the commodity prices have been uh, hitting historic lows. Uh. So those companies, they were suffering silently. Uh. So you, you never heard of this. So they, they're in a whole lot of pain. Uh, but recently, you know, they, they're probably uh, having it a little bit better. 
Um, and uh, if you read Ray Dalio's book, um, um, it's quite interesting. So he talks about 10 year cycles, right? 10 years, uh, last 10 years, very bad for commodity companies. Uh, and countries, countries are in countries, yes. And then the next 10 years, probably that's their time, right? The, the things happen in a cycle. Um, and uh, so the, 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 the balance of power in the world, I think, uh, would, would shift uh, from uh, commodity importing countries to commodity exporting countries. So you take a look, I mean, what, well, who are the commodity exporting countries, right? Um, well, Russia, that's Malaysia, one of ah, Malaysia. Yes. Malaysia, that's right, that's right. Um, so yeah, so yeah, Malaysia, Indonesia, Brazil, right? Um, now we've got to back them for chicken, uh, so you know, I can imagine. Um, so yeah, they, they, these are the guys who have been suffering in the last 10 years. Finally, it's their, their day in the sun. Um, then who are the guys who are importing? Poor Singapore, right? So <laughs> I think we are in a pretty precarious situation. And but. Um, you know, on a serious note, I think if you look at China, China is, um, what, what do you think? Exporting or importing countries? Ask, ask. <laughs> well, it's got, it's, it's got a bit of both, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, but it's an exporting, it's a net exporter because it's got, uh, uh, diffi- I mean, it's got uh, surpluses with everybody, doesn't but it? I think in general, actually, you look at China, uh, historically, it's actually been a net importer, right? It's, that's why it's go around trying to secure supply of oil, of commodities, uh, and then recently you probably heard the US complain that, hey, you know, China is, uh, has been hogging uh, 68% of the world's grains uh, right now, currently. They, like, they, are, they have been hoarding grains for the last couple of years, right? So, um, so yeah, so not on a, on a uh, you know, they have very little arable land for the kind of population that they have. Uh, so it's one of the lowest, uh, you know, in terms of uh, uh, arable land per, per capita. So yeah, they import food, they import energy. So that's, that's one thing to consider. I mean, the next 10 years, it's a headwind. I mean, it's not, it's not that the China is doomed, um, but what China does well is it takes some of these commodities, uh, rejigs it, you know, comes out uh, uh, um, you know, gadgets and sell it to you at a higher price. So that's their saving grace. That's called value add. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but is, that why, uh, is that why China's so interested in Taiwan? Or is that a no-no here? I'm going to take that question away. Well, I'm not supposed to talk about politics, like, but... <laughs> Yes, yes. Uh, oh, yeah, yes, that, that, that chart, yes. Um, very, very, very observant, yes. So, so there's the connection. So you have uh, one of the world's uh, largest semiconductor um, uh, producers in the world, and you have one of the largest uh, com- uh, semiconductor uh, demand user in the world. Um, is, they're just right next door to you. Um, they haven't been very cooperative. Uh, um, I wonder what happened to them. I don't know. I don't know because that's what, isn't that what Russia did to Ukraine? Because Ukraine was the largest wheat producer, and the Russia was the f- one of the largest yes. wheat producers. Yeah. Um, one of the tragedies in history is uh, you are a very weak country next to a very strong, militarily strong country, um, and in this case, also you know they have a lot of people. Uh, yeah, I leave it up to your imagination. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, all right. So, the, I, let, let's uh, look at this interesting question over here because I'm, I'm very curious about this um, crypto ecosystem because I don't know much about it. But I do realize that when interest rates started to rise, uh, the, you know, these cryptos um, started to um, come off. Well, what, why do you think so? Because this guy's the interest rate guy. Then I'll go through all of them. Have to go through TD Ameritrade because it allows you to buy and sell cryptos, doesn't it? In the future, so. um, not really. So <laughs> actually, we are not um, able to comment anything on crypto. Oh, okay, all right. So, 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 so interest rates. So, do, do interest rates have an impact on cryptos? So that's what I should ask. Um, I, I think I think almost certainly because um, if you think about it. <clears throat> No matter how you look at it, because there's a <clears throat> lack of intrin- intrinsic value or a lack of uh, transaction value around it, then it tends to thrive under two conditions. One is there's no opportunity cost of holding, that's to say interest rates are really low and it's a good time to go in. And, and the other proposition is one of the biggest lure factor, uh, I'm putting aside the getting away from government control and all, all that part, one of the biggest lure factor is when you've got the Fed doing huge quantitative easing and printing fiat currencies, then crypto's proposition is we can control the supply far better <clears throat> without all of this. And, and so 
that was the lure of it. And now when the Fed is doing the exact opposite, mopping up uh, US dollars, that proposition starts to crumble. Uh, and, and so you need to revisit uh, specific propositions rather than blanket statements, including what it's backed by. Uh, and, and one last thing to add about this is um, sometimes when, when we, we look at something, you know, things tend to be a double-edged sword. So if you say that no one is controlling the production of something, that at face value appears good because it's not uh, able to be manipulated, so, so to speak. I don't know enough about tech to comment on that. Uh, so that's my, my disclaimer. But the other point is the whole issue of money, no matter how you look at it, whether it's coins or notes or whatever, the, the whole thing depends on it being backed by an identifiable and credible authority because money at the end of the day is an IOU note. You need to go back, give it to someone, and say, this is what you owe me. And if you can't identify that person, it gets a bit hairy once uh, the, the speculative component wears out. So, and, and sorry, uh, I'm, I'm just very pessimistic that way, so temper it for your own uh, you know, appetite. So that's, that's the difference between normal cryptos and CBDCs, because they are backed by credit. Uh, yeah, what's your view on this, on this interest rate on crypto? Okay, trend? I'm not supposed to come in crypto, but... <laughs> 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 no, but, but I, 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 just, I have some thoughts on it. I mean, um, okay, because I don't know anything about crypto, so I can't comment on it either. Carry on. So, so excellent points by, by Vishnu. Um, so I, I think uh, you can think of uh, cryptos as uh, tax stocks on steroids. Right, so they basically they, they are growth, uh, you know, companies uh, in a way. Uh, Bitcoin is a bit of a special uh, case. It's not really uh, doesn't really have use case other than for payments and store of value. Um, so, so everything that I said just now about tech stocks and interest rates and uh, discount rates that apply to to crypto companies lah. Most other crypto companies, like I said, Bitcoin is an exception, um, and uh, to a, to a much so you, whatever that you, you think about the, the beta on tech, you just multiply by 10 or 50 you know, on, on, on the Bitcoin. And same with volatility and all that sort of stuff. But um, on, on, the, on the question of Bitcoin um, as, a, as a, a store of value, um, uh, that, that might have uh, some merit. I, I'm, I'm, uh, well, long, long, long time ago, I was an economist. And uh, in school, I studied economics. And uh, you know, the, we're, we're answering a very, again, a very existential uh, question: What is money? Like, you know, what is not? You know, money is uh, not really uh, notes and coins anymore. Actually, I think uh, it's a bit out, outmoded. Uh, you might think it is, but uh, in fact, if you look at uh, again in U.S. case, uh, you look at the money supply. How how much is the uh, notes and coins as a percentage of the money supply? All right, hardly ten percent, I would guess. So, so money, the concept of money is very nebulous, right? So and then you, you think about the Bitcoin. Is Bitcoin money? Um, okay, anyway, everybody has a strong view on, on uh, pros and the cons of that. But I, I leave you with the thought la, that um, normally money is uh, whatever people accept to be money. And there's a, I remember I, I spoke about network effect earlier on. So the more people think that um, you know, this thing is money, the more value or more credibility it has. Remember, seashells have been used for money. Rocks have been used for money. You know, anything. I mean, the, you know, you read, read about World War II accounts. Cigarettes in jails are used for money, right? Anything. I mean, as long as everybody agrees it's money, it is money, right? So I just leave you with this thought. Lah. So is, is Bitcoin really money? Um, and uh, again, uh, for those uh, technical chartists out there, actually, Again, you, you saw the chart on Amazon, right? It's again, it, it could well be the chart of Bitcoin, by the way, right? Bitcoin can go up and down 50% in, in, in one year. So what's going to happen in the future, right? If you are into Bitcoin, you believe in Bitcoin, could it be another Amazon? Right? Could it be, you know, 10 bucks today and uh, 3,000 bucks uh, 10 years later? Um, well, yeah. Well, except it moves 50% in a day, Bitcoin. Yeah, well, okay, yeah. So uh, tech stock on steroids, there you go. <laughs> Okay, now let's say that you talked about the network effect, isn't it? So there's a question here. Grab has dropped so much since its listing. Is it too cheap to ignore now? Despite its losses, yeah. Okay, I'm not supposed to give individual stock recommendations, but <laughs> let me let me give you some thoughts on on that. Okay. Um, 
yes, that's right. They were both dropped a, a lot. So I think the, um, my own personal, I share with you my own personal experience. The first question I always ask is, is this company going to be around next year, three years later, five years later? Right? And this is the one question that you need to answer because if it's going to go kaput, then you know, there's no point talking about it. Um, yes, then the second question is, can loss-making companies uh, still um, see their share price go up and have value? I think I, I answered the question tonight. Basically, because of network effect, yes. Right? But uh, how do you value this? This is a, this is a million dollar question. Right? Everybody has a, what, what is the correct value? It's the same thing with, uh, again, going back to Bitcoin. What is the intrinsic value of Bitcoin? What is the intrinsic value of, of Grab? Because if you use the traditional measures, um, that, that there isn't cash flows to disc discount, uh, unfortunately, right? So, um, yeah, it's a very, very difficult question. Uh, I, I leave it uh, to, <laughs> to all of you to... to but um, if, you, if you do want to... I mean, there are many kinds of investors uh, or speculators, right? Um, um, if you do want to trade, then you have to look at the technicals, which, again, I, I'm sure TD Ameritrade can, can help you with that. Daniel, what is your view on these, this kind of company? And you can't specifically... Uh, speak on specific companies, but you know. I would add on to Paul's um, I think last comment. So it depends on your approach in terms of investing or trading, short term, mid term, or long term. So in terms of short term speculation, it is the volatility is there. You can see for yourself whether you want to engage that volatility or not, and how much you want to put in that engagement. So in terms of long term wise, we fall back on business fundamentals in, in terms of network effect. Uh, how else the founder is driving the company. So we look at it from a business owner's point of view and see how much we want to commit in the mid to long term. So I think that is a very um, relevant approach that, that I live with you all. Do you want to say anything about Grab and C? Uh, I, I know next to nothing about it, please. Okay, the, all right, all right, all right. So we let this, uh, 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 this is a bit, more of, a bit more value for us. Uh, in terms of valuations, which subsectors in technology offer the most undervalued stocks? Wow, well, my, my head is spinning from the question. <laughs> so many subsectors. Um, okay, the three okay. that you spoke about, the three that you, you, you talked about, the designers, the, the yeah, foundries, okay. and what was the third one? Okay, see, this is, a, this is a question of whether you, you normally you want to buy a Proton or you want to buy a Lamborghini. It's different, right? So some people like to buy cheap stocks. Uh, some people like to buy, uh, okay, or BMW. Huh? BMW, good. It's, not ex it's, it's value for money. It's not exactly cheap. Okay, value for money. Yeah, let's talk about yeah, value. Right. So In terms of valuations, you know, value for money. Yeah. Um, okay. So I, 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 like I said, I think I, I like some of these uh, IC design companies. You know, they, um, they generate a lot of value, right? Uh, and I can continue to see strong growth going in the future. Let's say company like Nvidia. I mean, if you believe that uh, AI and things are going to continue to progress in the next three to five years, then they're going to create a lot more value. Um, are they exp Are they cheap now? I don't think they're cheap. Are they cheaper than they were six months ago? You know, the share price has halved, right? So, um, and then, can it go cheaper? Sure, why not? Um, so again, I think the the the, the you know the technicals would, would uh, determine when you want to buy a stock like that. But I would say that yeah, um, IC design companies are a great uh, target for the long long term. Lots of cash flow, he says, yes, yeah? yes, yes. and 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 so that can offset that some of that discount rate thing if they, the cash yeah. flow can grow as fast okay. as the discount. And, and uh, yeah, you're right. They're actually making money and they're actually paying dividends. Yeah. Yep. So buy and hold till the market turns up. Do you, you know, Leonard, you showed some of your companies, your different types of, out of those, those few sectors, do you see any that are undervalued or is there any, any that would offer any potential? I would say, um, I would say telecom itself, if you see, uh, it, they are always in the background. So they are not always in the foreground, they are not the fang stocks, they are not sexy. But then, if you, if you see volatility coming in, you see some potential of recession coming in, Telecom itself yeah. is a stable One company minute. that you can see, One for example, like AT&T. AT&T is a huge company, uh, and then in terms of yield itself, I think it's 7%. So it is something, and the stock price itself, stock price is always uh, an advertising mechanism. 
So whereas it advertises seeing you, demonstrating you, are you, do you want to engage in, do you want to invest? And then it's not as chunky as possible. So one area you can look at is telecom itself. And within telecom, Verizon, AT&T, those are, are pretty stable when it comes to recessions. Okay, thanks. So, so I'm going to wait, wait, you hang on. I'll come to you later. I want to ask this question about the semi-con cycle. There's this question about the semiconductor cycle. So is capacity looming? Um, is it still, okay, of course, because everybody are investors here, is it still okay to buy local semi-con plays like AEM Holdings, UMS Holdings, Franken, Grand Venture Technology, etc.? cetera? So Maybe I'll speak generally, right? Um, uh, okay, so the big picture we, 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 we have painted just now, you know, the, the, the growth uh, for the semiconductor industry, it's it's quite you know it's quite strong in the uh, next couple of years. Um, is the capacity looming? Um, yes, uh, yeah. Well, just just last year we we're talking about huge shortages, aren't we? I mean, yeah. So um, has it come back into balance? I think still not yet. I mean, we're still in a little bit of shortage uh, situations, um, but of course the different companies are different situations. So I think you, you just uh, look. You can analyze that whether the the, the services. Uh, the, the particular sector, subsector that they serve is still uh, in shortage. Uh, but uh, there are plenty out there, um, you know, for instance, like at TSMC, that, you know, you know the, the demand for their chips are still hot. I mean, they're, they're growing at more than 40%, uh, 45%, I think, year on year. So, yep, a lot of opportunities out there. Okay, so the, so the uh, uh, next question is still with, so this is especially to Paul. Paul Ho. In your opinion, <laughs> what best, how best to play tech? ETF, SGX, NASDAQ? <laughs> um, I, well, because I'm a stock picker, so I normally pick stocks. But yes, I mean, um, it's a very hazardous business uh, for most people. Um, ETFs, um, so you, you, you can like a couple of uh, uh, NASDAQ uh, ETFs, right? I mean, you, you, you kept the QQQ. Um, and so you, you can consider some of those. Uh, they're more diversified, uh, you know, safer for, for uh, more yeah, safer in general uh, than the individual stocks. And then there is the, I think it's the SOXX, the SOX, um, specifically the, the, semicon well, yeah, the semiconductor index. So that's very specific. Um, I personally like it. Um, and then the, um, there is, uh, recently I discovered actually in, in well, I, I spoke about China. Uh, China's uh, future uh, the semiconductor uh, growth, uh, and uh, you can participate in those. I think there's one uh, ETF for Chinese semiconductor that's listed in the Hong Kong exchange. Uh, sadly, none in Singapore. Um, so yeah, th those are areas that you can look at. Okay, thanks. Uh, so um, I've been told there's one minute left. Okay, look. So what's the implication of stagflation along with recession? I've just got to. I, I mean, this is a question here, but I, I, I'm also curious whether there's a greater probability of stagflation or recession or none of them. Um, so since we've got one minute left, I'll keep it short. Um, so a, a stagflation need not um, preclude a recession. So the stagflation is just when you've got uh, inflation that's high despite a downturn. Uh, or, or very weak growth. So this is an entire spectrum, whether it's a slight downturn, very low growth, or an outright recession. What's odd, or, or the, uh, the question to ask is, if we do go into a deeper recession, does that bring inflation down quickly enough or not? And the worrying point about that is maybe not, because some of these uh, price or cost shocks that we see are not demand driven. So just because demand drops doesn't mean you'll immediately see uh, inflation coming off. So that's the worry for us right now. Uh, whereas, uh, you know, words like stagflation and recession have an entire range around them. So. Okay, so that's all you use. Okay, okay right. so I think I've been told that I've only got one minute left, but I'm going to ask Elena to end it with what sectors of the market are expected to do well in the next few months? I would say um, it comes back to the hype. We have to see hype, the hype stocks that I mentioned. Um, they can be a leading indicator. So they are maybe trading sideways or going off. And then they should be leading you on where the interest is redrawing out and rotating into sectors that they are being invested into. So I cannot pinpoint exactly the sectors that is being engaged, but then I can point out that the hype stocks are dropping 
and then we will see the sh um, growth, growth, um, the, the shoots of growth, where are they coming up in, in after the hype ends. Okay, so I think we have to, do you want to add to that? Sectors, sectors that could... Uh, I have a tech in this right. Okay, so he likes tech. He likes tech, tech stuff with good cash flow and he's so, shown us a whole lot of them. Okay, great. Okay, so I'm afraid that's all we have the time for. And thank you very, very much for staying for this morning. And uh, it's been wonderful to see you again, everybody, but a bit daunting because we've been Sorry, in our little hermit holes for so long. Okay, thank you then. Thanks, and thank you to the speakers.